Tonight, federal government makes U-turn, suspends planned removal of subsidy on petrol by June, says initial timing of decision it was problematic. AFDB President Dr. Akim Yadishino describes ongoing Dangote refinery, petrochemical and subsea pipeline infrastructure projects as Africa's growth acceleration company. Proprietor of Noble Kids School, Abdul Malik Tanko, and two other suspects arraigned in court over kidnap and murder of five year old Hanifat Abubakar in Kano. And Burkina Faso military confirms takeover of government, citing worsening security situation in the country. Nigeria condemns coup and detention of President Rock Kabore. Plus, international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, credit rating agency Augusto & Co. asks Central Bank of Nigeria to resume dollar sales to Bureau de Change operators to reduce pressure in Nigeria's foreign exchange market. On sports news tonight, debut on Gambia Stan Guinea to advance to the quarterfinal of the African Cup of Nations in Cameroon. And from Abuja, Federal High Court in the city issues warrant of arrest against former Minister of Petroleum Resources, Diziani Alison Madueke, the second after that of the FCT High Court in 2018. The dust raised by the federal government's earlier hint of the planned removal of subsidy on petrol appears now to have settled. This comes as the Minister of Finance, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, today announced that the government has suspended the initial plan to remove the subsidy from July 2022 as it became clear that the timing was problematic. She made the disclosure during a meeting convened at the instance of the President of the Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan. Our correspondent, Linda Akibwe, reports. The Senate President is aware of the gravity of his remarks on the removal of petroleum subsidy last week Tuesday, as well as the ripples it has caused, as he convenes this meeting with petroleum industry players to discuss the way forward on the sensitive issue of the removal of fuel subsidy. And this meeting, as far as we are concerned, is going to go on after this one. There could be another one, uh, all in search of ways and means of ensuring that that ordinary Nigerian does not suffer any hardship. Now I'm taking this opportunity to appeal to TUC and NLC to share this uh, plan to, to go on, on strike or demonstration. It's totally unnecessary. There is not going to be. Uh, removal subsidy, so th th there's no need for this. The Minister of Finance explains that provision was made for the payment of petroleum subsidy in the 2022 budget to only cover the period of January to June 2022. However, she says present economic realities necessitate another approach to the subsidy matter. After the bu budget was passed and we have had consultations with a number of stakeholders it became clear that the timing is problematic, that practically there is still heightened inflation, and also removal of subsidy will further worsen the situation, thereby imposing more difficulties on the citizens. And Mr. President clearly does not want to do that. As we're discussing right now within the executive the possibility of amending the budget, we may need to come back to the National Assembly by way of amendment to make additional provision for full subsidy from uh, July 2022 going forward, or whatever period is agreed is the right uh, timing. The Minister of State's Petroleum is emphatic in his stand that subsidy removal should be shelved for now. It is very clear. It is uh, clear to the blind and uh, uh, audible to the deaf that it is not possible at this time for us to remove the subsidy. Regardless of the reasons for stalling the removal of fuel subsidy, be it economic or political considerations, this matter will simply not fade away until a permanent solution is found once and for all. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. 
And while the Petroleum Industry Act provides for a full deregulation of the petroleum industry in Nigeria, the suspension of the planned removal of the fuel subsidy appears to have thrown a spanner in the works. Our next report looks at the debate on the fuel subsidy regime. He didn't tell anybody that we should go and remove petroleum subsidy. The president of the Senate made this declaration after meeting with President Buhari on the heels of the debate on the proposed removal of fuel subsidy. However, that position goes contrary to the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act, which was signed by President Muhammad Buhari on August 16, 2021. Section 53 of the Act provides that the NNPC Limited and any of its subsidiaries shall conduct their affairs on a commercial basis in a profitable and efficient manner without recourse to government funds. I really wonder how the industry is going to function perfectly and uh, optimally in line with what was envisaged uh, under reform as long as this supposed subsidy continues. We have to remind ourselves why the Petroleum Industry Act has come into being in the first place. And one is to establish a framework for the creation of a commercially oriented and profit-driven national petroleum company. According to the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, 250 billion naira is paid on fuel subsidy every month on the average. Four states in Nigeria take up to 40% of Nigeria's petrol consumption. The impact of spending more money on fuel subsidy is affecting the government's revenue. Whilst planning to stop the spending, the government has plans for the impact the removal would have on Nigerians. What you're dealing with is about 243 billion naira of fuel subsidies every month. Anyone can take his telephone and compute this. 60 million litres times um, 135 naira times 30 days. It will give you 243 billion. So there's no magic around this. We already agreed it will be 5,000 Naira and we also agreed that the remittances have to be done digitally so the e-Naira will help but also so uh, the various payment platforms that are currently available. However, the government has been warned on the implication of a hike in the price of petrol. Fuel prices are expected to rise significantly in the coming months as announced last November by the NNPC. We all know when this happens, as the government has planned, it will push many millions deeper into poverty. When that policy pronouncement was made, organized labor met, and we issued a statement rejecting that policy to say if the policy is about continue to import and then in the name of subsidy removal, hike the price, which will then make life unbearable for average Nigerians. This may have informed the government's decision to review its stance on the proposed removal of fuel subsidy. I will tell you categorically that at this moment now, uh, the complete removal of subsidy is not in our plate at all. The president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is not in support of removing subsidy at this time. The funds to cater for fuel subsidy is included in the 2022 budget at least till June 2022 as the federal government shelves plans to remove fuel subsidy. The question now is how will this affect the Petroleum Industry Act? We will return to the fuel subsidy matter shortly. But meanwhile, the ongoing Dangote Refinery Petrochemical and Subsea Pipeline Infrastructure projects continue to receive commendation from various stakeholders. The president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akumi Adishino, has described it as Africa's growth acceleration company. The AFDB president said this during his visit to the facilities in Lagos, where he applauded the president of the Dangote Group for his vision to develop Africa. Africa through industrialization. It's an august occasion for the Dangote Group as the AFDB team, led by its president Akimumi Adishino, visits the Dangote World Class Project in Ibeduleki, Lagos. The tour takes him to the largest subsea pipeline infrastructure in the world, 
1,100 kilometers, set to handle 3 billion standard cubic foot of gas per day. The team also visits the world's second largest urea plant with a capacity of 3 million tons per annum. The world scale gas treatment station, petrochemical complex, 555 megawatts power plant, 500 kiloton per annum polyethylene plant, and a central control room. So, with that, we call this uh, the technology among the best technology. The team rounds off the tour at the largest single train petroleum refinery in the world, sited on 148,900 pilings and with a processing capacity of 650,000 barrels of crude oil in a day. What has gone into the project and the expected outcome and impact are simply mind-blowing, according to the AFDB president. I see a company that I will proudly call Africa Growth Accelerator Company. So if you want to call this company, just call it AGAC. Africa growth, Africa's Growth Acceleration Company. And why do I say that? You see an acceleration of how to reduce imports. You see an acceleration of how to have an outbound on export. You see an acceleration on value chain development here, on how to make them competitive regionally and also globally. Meanwhile, the president of the Dangote Industries, Aliko Dangote, expresses gratitude at the support the project has enjoyed from the federal government as well as the African Development Bank. Without the support of the government, uh, you know, the central bank and the bankers, I mean, developing banks like yours, there is no way we have actually succeeded in building this massive, uh, you know, uh, industrial. Uh, you know, pack. I mean, it's a major revolution. Once we finish, uh, definitely, you know, it will put Nigeria on the map. According to Ali Kudangote, the refinery is expected to commence production by the third quarter of 2022. In part two, after the break, proprietor of Noble Kids Go, Abdulmalik Tanko, and two other suspects arraigned in court over kidnap and murder of five-year-old Hanifa Tabubaka in Kano. Plus, we'll be taking a further look at the issues surrounding fuel subsidy and how they affect the Petroleum Industry Act. We have an energy expert, Emeka Akabogu, to discuss this. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Federal government makes U-turn, suspends planned removal of subsidy on petrol by June, says initial timing of decision was problematic. AFDB President Dr. Akumi Adishino describes ongoing Dangote refinery, petrochemical and subsea pipeline infrastructure project as Africa's growth acceleration company. Proprietor of Noble Kids School, Abdulmalik Tanko, and two other suspects arraigned in court over kidnap and murder of five-year-old Hanifa Tabubaka in Kano. And Burkina Faso military confirms takeover of government, citing worsening security situation in the country. Nigeria condemns coup and detention of President Rock Kabore. now dig deeper into the fuel subsidy matter and joining us to discuss this is an energy expert Dr Emeka Akabogu. Welcome to the news at 10 tonight. Thank you very much for having me. So now we know it's obvious there will not be a removal of fuel subsidy um, by June. Did that come as a surprise to you? Um, well I'd say it came as a surprise really because um, I mean, while I understand the concerns of the Senate presidents, of the officials who have made this pronouncement, um, the pronouncement 
would indeed amount to these same officials becoming traducers of the law, if I may put it that way. Because the withdrawal of the, of the intended um, removal of subsidy um, is, flies in the face of the Petroleum Industry Act. It um, it's, uh, amounts to um, turning the law on its head. And um, I'd say indeed that they don't have the power to do that, under the law as it is. So where exactly does that live the Petroleum Industry Act as it stands? Okay, it's, let, let, let's just break it down. There are two issues which are implicated in this circumstance. So one is deregulation of the petroleum industry, um, of the deregulation of the pricing of petroleum products, and the other is the concept of subsidy as a whole and its um, place within the regime of the Petroleum Industry Act. So with regard to deregulation, I mean, the very fact that the Act expressly provides for deregulation of the pricing of petroleum products means that you can't have prices being fixed by the government. The Act is actually very, very specific in its conditions. And it says that wholesale and retail prices of petroleum products shall be based on unrestricted free market pricing conditions. It's a mandatory provision in the Act. Um, so you can't have prices of petroleum products being fixed. And when they are fixed, such fixtures are Ill illegal. So we have to have that in mind. Then the second issue is the issue of subsidies in itself. Now, subsidies within the context of the Act really um, shouldn't stay anything beyond February because the Act is quite clear to on um, that provision. NMPC, uh, as it is, is now a limited um, company which means it must be commercially operated. In fact, that's the language of the Act. NSPC, NMPC must be commercially run. And when it is not commercially run, that will be a breach by both its board and its management. So within that context, if you're providing for subsidies, NMPC certainly can provide for subsidies. Okay? Um, the Act provides a window um, of six months from the commencement of the Act for the federal government to request NMPC to serve as a supplier of last resort, which means that the NMPC may deploy any means at its disposal to supply petroleum products and ensure petroleum products are in the market, probably at a cost or at a price which the government is comfortable with, but the government must bear those costs. And this can't last beyond six months, which is February, 2022. But the defense of the government is high inflation costs the economic realities. Is that not good enough? It's an absolutely understandable defense. However, it flies in the face of the law. That's the point. So it's either you want to implement the law or you are breaking the law or you actually call for this law to be suspended. You withdraw the law, you repeal it, amend it. But in the circumstances, you can't be approbating and reprobating, which is what the government is doing in this particular circumstance. So do you think that Nigeria can really, is there like a lasting solution to this debacle, if you subsidy? Certainly, certainly. I mean, the truth is, the Nigerian economy and the value of the Nigerian Naira today um, is very low. And the high cost of fuel um, um, relative to the purchasing power of Nigerians is a function of the value of the Naira. That's the reality. But despite that, the cost of the fuel which we have in Nigeria remains among the lowest which we have within the region. So the only panacea to this is local refining of petroleum products. But even if you're lo refining locally, it doesn't solve it completely because the parties who are refining locally still have to incur costs they get crude at the market value. So unless the government decides that it will supply the crude oil for local production at a price which is significantly below the international market price, that's the only thing that can solve it. But otherwise, you still have to deal with existing costs scenarios. Um, and that's with regard to the refining of the um, petroleum. So 
I mean, I have about two questions now I'm thinking of, and that is uh, the hope of the Dangote refinery coming to save the day in this case. And perhaps the next one is the other stakeholders who are saying um, removing fuel subsidies, so no, no today, like the NLC and, and the others. Well, the Dangote refinery is going to be very useful. And within the context of the last answer I gave, the Dangote refinery will be useful if Dangote gets crude oil specially supplied to him at a rate which is significantly lower than the international market rate for the purpose of local supply of petroleum products. If that happens, then we may have low prices relative to what should be a commercial price. So that's one. Um, with regards to the concerns of the NLC and labor and all that, these are very valid concerns. And governments, having that in mind, need to look at options in the line with what I've just said, or other options which could, in the circumstances, um, ameliorate. But it must be said that there's a third party, which is the parties who supply the petroleum products, the marketers. So these people are also in business, and they're not there to give them fuel for charity. So at the end of the day, all those interests have to be put, um, uh, they, they come in play. And I think that um, it's important that, as a country, we realize that we probably are not as rich as we think we are. Um, we have a high population, but a significant number of that high population um, live below um, the poverty line. And that's why we um, are feeling the heat of um, these price increases, which within the global context are, significantly, are not significant in, in, in the scheme of things. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Dr. Emeka Kabogu is an energy expert. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much. And we head over to our Buja studios where Mark Ogun Yusuf has some more stories. Hello, Mark Bair. Hello, Millicent. It's good to see you. Well, we'll start off in the northwest of the country, in Kano precisely, where the proprietor of Noble Kids School in that state, Abdul Malik Tanko, as well as two other suspects, were arraigned today before a magistrate's court for their role in the death of a five year old pupil, Hanifat Abubakar. At the commencement of trial, the court read out the charges to the accused, to which they all consented, before the case was adjourned until February the 2nd this year. The Attorney General of Kano State gave the assurance that justice will be served in the next one or two months on the matter and pleaded with the people of Kano to be civil and not take laws into their hands. What I would like to assure you is that the Ministry of Justice is going to, within the next three, four days, file a charge before the proper court. Uh, we intend to pursue this case vigorously and within the next month or two by the grace of god we are going to finish with the prosecution of this case i call on all people of kano state to please stay calm let the law take its course um, we are a society of law abiding citizens um, we do know that it is very very painful when this kind of things happen we tend to ask ourselves what is happening with our society, but you should all understand that uh, we are living peacefully because of the rules and regulations we have, because of the laws governing us. Uh, if not for those laws and if not for the security agencies uh, and the security agents, uh, these suspects will not have been arrested within the shortest possible time. Meanwhile, anger continues to trail the abduction and killing of Hanifat Abu Bakr. Unknown persons at about 1.30 a.m. today stormed the premises of the school which they attended in Dakata community of Nasarawa local government area in the state, setting it ablaze. In the south-south of the country, it's a little something to chair in Bayelsa State where the abducted Commissioner for Trade, Industry and Investment, Mr. Federal Otokito, has regained his freedom after spending four days with his abductors. Mr. Otokito, who looked traumatized with swollen eyes, was released earlier today. He expressed his gratitude to the state government as well as security agents who helped in securing his release. 
want to sincerely thank you and the deputy governor and the entire team for intervening in this my matter. If not of your prompt intervention, the pressure the government puts on them, I could have been a dead man. Your Excellency, I'm very, very grateful to you and the deputy governor, the security agents, and whoever that joined hands to bring me back to life. I was almost a dead man. I thought I would never even come back to see my children. Meanwhile, the governor of Bayelsa State, Doye Diri, who received the commissioner at the government house in Yenagua, reaffirmed the fact that no ransom was paid and also used the occasion to announce the dismissal of a paramount ruler and other persons over the kidnap saga. A member of the Bayelsa State Executive Council who was kidnapped on Thursday, the 20th of January, 2022, is now sitting with us here as a freed man. And so I'd like to thank God for his mercies and also to thank the security agencies in Bielsa State for living up to their bidding and all other sources that has assisted leading up to the release of the Honorable Commissioner. The paramount ruler of Otokoti community is here by the post and the security agencies have been directed to further question him on the complicity on the kidnap of the Honorable Commissioner. And in his place, Chief R.O. Abe will now be acting as the paramount ruler of Otopoti community. Still ahead on the news at 10, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission amends a 17-count charge against former Minister of Aviation, Femi Fani Kayode. Do join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. In the courts, Justice Bolaji Olajuwo of the Federal High Court Abuja has issued a warrant of arrest against the former Minister of Petroleum Resources, Diziani Alisim Madweke, who's believed to be residing in the UK. This is the second arrest warrant issued on a former minister, the first being that issued by the FCT High Court on December the 4th, 2018. Justice Olajuwon granted the request that the counsel to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Farouk Abdullah, made an oral application. The court had fixed November the 3rd, 2021 for the EFCC to give a report on its efforts at extraditing Alice Madweke to the country to stand her trial and for possible mention of the case. But on the adjourned date, the case was stored as neither the EFCC nor Alice Madweke was present. However, when the matter was called, the EFCC counsel told the court that all efforts by the agency to get the ex-minister extradited when the matter was before the former judge, Justice Ojuku, were unsuccessful. After granting the application, Justice Olajuwon adjourned the matter indefinitely, pending when the defendant is arrested and produced in court. Meanwhile, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has arraigned a former Minister of Aviation, Femi, Mr. Femi Fanikayade, on an amended 17-count charge of money laundering. Mr. Fanikayade is standing trial alongside a former Minister of State for Finance, Denadi Usman, a former chairman of the Association of Local Government of Nigeria, Algon, Yusuf Danjuma, and a company, Joint Trust Dimensions Nigeria Limited. The EFCC had earlier preferred a 17-count charge of 4.6 billion naira money laundering against the defendant before the former trial judge, Justice Mohammed Aikawa. The defendants had each pleaded not guilty to the counts and were granted bail. At the proceedings today, the amended 17-count charge was read to the defendants and they each pleaded not guilty. After the plea, the prosecution counsel, Mr. Rotimi Oyedipo, asked the court for a trial date. In a short ruling, the court allowed the defendants to continue on the existing bill conditions and adjourned the matter to March the 11th for trial. 
And staying with legal matters, the trial of an oil marketer, Abu Bakr Peters, and his company, Nadabo Energy Limited, for an alleged 1.4 billion naira subsidy fraud failed to go on today owing to the absence of the defendant's lead counsel. The lead counsel, however, sent a junior lawyer, Abbas Oyeyemi, who told the court that the defense could not continue with the cross-examination of the fifth prosecution witness, the chairman of the EFCC, Abdul Rashid Bawa, because they were yet to get the certified true copies of the court's proceedings. The counsel requested for an adjournment instead. While adjourning till tomorrow, January the 25th, for continuation of hearing, Justice Christopher Balogun warned the defense not to waste judicial time of the court. The judge also directed the registrars of the court to release to the defendant whatever documents are needed for its case. And that's all from our, from our ways here in Abuja. It's back now to you, Millicent. Many thanks, Magbe. And let's take you back to the earlier story of the five-year-old, uh, the death of the five-year-old pupil, Hanifa Tabubaka. The Kano state government has revoked the operating licenses of all private schools in the state. The decision was announced at a press briefing in Kano by the State Commissioner for Education, Mr. Sanusi Kiro. Uh, this is coming on the heels of the sad event that happened in Noble Comprehensive School, a private school where Hanifa Tabubaka, a five-year-old, was kidnapped and murdered by her, allegedly by her proprietor. To all the stories now, the Vice President, Professor Yemishi Bajo, has been highlighting the outcomes of the federal government's interventions, especially in terms of job creation and poverty reduction. Professor Shibajo was speaking at the launch of the Bank of Industries Aid for Productivity Report in Abuja, where he said that over 4 million jobs have been created with credits and grants pegged at over $4 million disbursed over the past five years. He's also promising that more interventions are underway to boost that activities of the micro, small and medium enterprises. Government officials and members of the private sector at an event to appraise an intervention that commenced five years ago and to further strengthen the platform to engage more MSMEs through the provision of funding using targeted programs. Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibaju emphasizes the role of the MSME in economic recovery, promising further support for the sector. Today we witness the successes of a long and ambitious journey targeting and impacting MSMEs with interventions. The results, in my view, have far exceeded even what was envisioned. The infrastructure and processes that have been built to achieve this are nothing short of remarkable. Today, what we have is BOI's growth platform, Africa's largest infrastructure for direct interventions to MSMEs. With a credit and grants loan portfolio of over $400 million, the Bank of Industries programs, such as the Government Empowerment Enterprise Program, the Northeast Rehabilitation Fund, MSME Survival, amongst others, is ameliorating the plight of some entrepreneurs. But it is not yet through, and the Bank of Industry is unveiling a plan for 10 million Nigerians. As a bank, we are not resting on our laurels. We continue to expand our project portfolio and to reach out to MSMEs. At our pace of growth, we can impact up to 10 million MSMEs by 2025. There are also words from development partners. They are promising more commitments in growing MSMEs across the country. We believe that the market can work for the poor. Philanthropy can be a powerful way to ensure all people can benefit from advances in health and economic development. The World Bank partnered with the federal government and the state governments to provide swift policy response to viable yet vulnerable MSMEs that were urgently needing it. The overall objective of the Bank of Industry is to boost activities of MSME towards job creation, poverty reduction and self-reliance.
And a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Professor Kingston Moalu, is faulting the frontline role of the CBN in agriculture. He says while the CBN is allowed to get involved in development financing, it cannot be a dominant player. Professor Moalu describes the situation as a state's failure. He was speaking to our political correspondent, Terry Ikumi. So should it now be the Central Bank of Agriculture? Is that, is that what a central bank ideally should be? I was actually in charge of, of development finance as deputy governor for financial stability for three years. So, and we used this provision to do our own form of what we call quantitative easing after the global financial crisis, to inject money into the economy to stabilize it. And we did fairly well. And so there is um, scope for the, for the central bank to get involved in these types of things. But it's about proportion. The reason why the central bank can get involved in these things is that we are not the Bank of England. We are a developing country. We still have developmental challenges. And there's nothing wrong if the central bank plays a certain critical role in that universe, but not as the only player, or not even as the dominant player, you know? But if it now comes to what we're seeing today. A former head of state called me and asked me, Kingsley, you were a central banker. I said, yes, sir. He said, can you answer a question for me? Why does it seem as if the central bank is everywhere, doing everything, intervening in every sector of the economy? I said, sir, it's a reflection of state failure period. It's a reflection of the failure of state capacity. The federal, where is the Federal Ministry of Finance? Where is the Federal Ministry of Agriculture? Where is the Federal Ministry of, you name it. Why does it have to be the central bank in front of everything? It's because the fiscal aspect of running the government is simply insolvent. They cannot do anything. So every problem called the central bank governor. Every problem called the central bank governor. For the full interview, watch Political Paradigm on Tuesday at 9am, only on Channels Television. Up next is Business News. Here's Anne Wilder. Thanks a lot, Millicent. Hello and welcome to Business News. To reduce the current pressure in Nigeria's foreign exchange market, the central bank must resume the sale of dollar to bureau de change operators, and that's according to credit rating agency Augusto & Co. At a webinar extraying the outlook for the country's economy this year amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the rating agency mentioned that the much-anticipated rate convergence in the foreign exchange market will take longer than expected, and if the CBN continues to maintain the official rate of 415.64 Kobo cited on its website. In July last year, the CBN announced that it had stopped the sale of dollar to authorized BDCs in the country. Meanwhile, the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee has started its first rates decision meeting for this year, which has drawn the attention of the country's financial and capital market operators, as well as economists. The two-day gathering of the MPC comes a week after the National Bureau of Statistics released the country's inflation report for the month of December, showing a rebound in inflation after eight consecutive months of decline. The outcome of the MPC meeting will be announced by the CBN Governor Godwin MFLA tomorrow, January the 25th. Now let's check on the global oil market. The prices are down for now after being hit by a stronger dollar and investor concerns over the possibility of quicker than expected increases in interest rates by U.S. Federal Reserve. International oil price benchmark Brent crude retreated from its earlier gains by 1.8% to end the day at $86.27 a barrel while West Texas Intermediate Group dipped by 2.15% to $83.31 a barrel. Let's head to the equities market now. It ended today's trading session on a negative note. Profit-taking on some components across four sectors of the market pulled back the index by a slim margin. Layo Adegoke has the details.
Thank you for joining us for the stock market report. It's a mildly negative start for the fourth trading week at the local exchange as the market takes a breather from the strong rally which dominated three sessions last week. 11 billion naira, that's the amount that investors knocked off from the over 800 billion naira gain recorded in the total value of equities listed on the NGX. And this translates to marginal 0.06% decline on the all share index. Well, let's zoom in on the sectoral performance indicator. We see that four out of the five sectors of the listed equities felt the impact of today's profit taking by investors. They all closed the day in the red, leaving only the oil and gas counter as the lone gainer. At the same time, total volume of equities traded today was lower by 1.06% when compared to Friday's turnover. However, the number of deals and value of transactions carried out were higher by 18.94 and 19.71% each. The stock market is about investing and, you know, reaping the benefits. And it seems investors are taking advantage of the late rally seen so far this month. But let's keep our fingers crossed for the outcome in Tuesday's session. And that's it on the stock market report. I'm Layo Adegoke. Thanks for watching Business News tonight. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you, Millicent. Thank you, Anne. The Nigerian government has condemned the coup in Burkina Faso and detention of President Rock Kabore. A statement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says Nigeria calls for President Kabore's immediate release and return to previously existing state of affairs. Earlier this evening, the Burkina Faso military said on state television it had seized power and overthrown President Kabore, citing the deteriorating security situation for the military takeover. Well, the president's whereabouts remain unclear, but the officer making the broadcast said he was in a secure location. Simon Pusey has more international news right now in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Fears are growing over the fate of hundreds of children believed to be held by jihadist extremists inside a besieged prison in northeast Syria. Video from the North Press Agency purports to show Islamic State militants being transported to detention centres. Nearly 850 children are thought to be inside a prison in Hasaka, which was stormed by Islamic State group fighters, triggering days of battles. At least 136 people have been killed since the jihadists launched their attack to try to free jailed fighters. The UK and US have started withdrawing staff from their embassies in Ukraine, with Boris Johnson saying the news wasn't good over the issue. Uh, intelligence is, is pretty gloomy on this point. There is certainly a, a large, uh, very, very large uh, array of Russian forces and we have to take the necessary steps. I don't think it's in, by any means inevitable now. I think that sense can still prevail. The UK's Prime Minister also confirmed that about half the British staff working in Kiev will return to the UK. The U.S. has ordered relatives of its embassy staff to leave, saying an invasion could come at any time. Russia has denied plans for military action, but tens of thousands of troops have amassed on the border. Tongan officials say up to 84% of its 105,000 population have been affected by ashfall and a tsunami caused by an underwater volcanic eruption. Tsunami waves from the eruption swept Tonga last week, destroying villages, buildings and the coast. The expulsion of volcanic ash and gases, as well as the flooding, have affected a majority of the population. Three people have been confirmed dead in the tsunami last week. The government has not announced any further deaths. An Australian man has pleaded guilty to abducting four-year-old Cleo Smith and holding her at home for 18 days. Cleo vanished from her family's tent last October while on a camping trip in Western Australia, sparking a huge search that gripped the country. Police later found her at a stranger's house in her hometown of Carnarvon, a short drive from the campsite. 
The president of Burkina Faso, Roque Cabore, has reportedly been detained by mutinying soldiers. Outside the presidential residence, several armoured vehicles were riddled with bullets and also stained with blood. It is not immediately clear if Kabore was in the vehicle when the attack took place. The government has denied suggestions of a military coup or that the president was under arrest. Retired tennis star Martina Navratilova has blasted a decision by Australian Open organisers to ban T-shirts supporting Chinese player Peng Shui. Security staff on Friday are spectators trying to enter the grounds to remove T-shirts saying, where is Peng Shui? Miss Peng disappeared for weeks after accusing a top Chinese official of sexual misconduct in November. She has since reappeared, but many remain concerned about her well-being. French fashion designer Thierry Mugler, who dressed Beyoncé and Lady Gaga, has died aged 73. Mugler, who reigned over fashion in the 1980s, was known for his daring theatrical designs featuring broad shoulders and plunging necklines. He dressed the likes of Beyoncé, Lady Gaga, David Bowie, Diana Ross and Duran Duran, among many others, during his career at the top of the industry. And finally, an Egyptian woman has created an innovative way for tourists to blend ancient Egyptian fashion with information technology. Ala Ahmed El Shaishtawe made the dress embroidered with pharaonic designs and a QR code that, once scanned, offers information to the country's top tourist attractions. Sewn into the sleeve of the dress, wearers can use their mobile phones to scan the code, taking them to an application with names, addresses, operating times and prices of Egypt's many famous sites. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Welcome to Sports News. Star forward Musa Baru scored in 71 minutes to take debutant Gambia, the lowest ranked team at the African Cup of Nations, into the quarterfinals with a 1 0 victory over Guinea in Bafosan earlier today. Baru scored with a close range shot to end the stalemate in a KG last 16 affair at the start Kwe Kang that was dominated by the rival defences. Both teams finished a man short with Gambia. Yusufa Nje dismissed on the 88 minutes, and Guinea Ibrahima Conte red carded in added time. Host Cameroon progressed to the quarterfinals of the African Cup of Nations with a 2 1 win over 10 man Camaros, despite a courageous performance from their depleted opponent. Gambia and Cameroon will face off in the last eight. As Malawi prepared to take on Morocco in the African Cup of Nations round of 16 on Tuesday, Coach Mario Marinisa feels his players have been treated like second-rate citizens because they are the underdogs. From washing their clothes by themselves and hanging them on the bushes to dry to not having enough food to eat, Marinisa deploys the shocking conditions the teams has faced. And that's it on Sports News. Back to you, Elsa. Thank you, Chris. And the main news again. The federal government today suspended the initial plan to remove subsidy on petrol by June, described the timing of the decision as problematic. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Central Walker. Have a good night. Stay safe.